Good morning, APU. I have um, an awesome opportunity to introduce our morning speaker, but first I have some awesome news to share with you. So today, I am officially nine months pregnant. Yeah. So I need you all to be very careful because I can like really go at any time, okay? <laughs> So I want, I want a few things to be done. When I return back next semester, I want Cougar Den to be finished. <laughs> and then when I come on stage, I'm gonna come with the nice little carrier and the baby when I preach, okay? Is that all right? No, but I do have the awesome privilege to introduce one of our own APU assistant professors in philosophy. Um, Dr. Joshua Rasmussen has a, holds a PhD in philosophy from Notre Dame with an expertise in metaphysics and the philosophy of mind. Yeah, that kind of went over my head too, but that's okay. His desire is for our students to gain a deeper understanding um, between um, the relationship between uh, truth and reality. So can we give Dr. Joshua Rasmussen, a warm Morning Chapel welcome. Well, th thank you, Tatiana, I really appreciate that. And it's a great honor to be with you guys here this morning. Before I came to APU, I taught at Notre Dame for a few years, and then I came to APU. And I just have to say, it's been a real joy being at APU, teaching, learning from students, having friends with faculty, and something I've noticed, a common feature of students that I've really grown to uh, see again and again, something that's so admirable, something that I discover when I try to make an argument and a student will raise their hand and, and uh, give an interesting response, but also ask me, why does this really matter? And how is this gonna help me? And I love that. What I've discovered, a common feature of APU students, is that they really care to make a difference in the world. That you guys, you want to be difference makers. And some of you want to change the whole world. And so as I'm thinking about that as a philosopher and as a thinker, naturally I'm wondering, how can you do that? How can you change the world? So after I moved here, I was going out to LA. Uh, you know, it's cool to be in uh, Southern California. There's a lot of things to explore. And so I was just driving down to Hollywood with my wife, and I was looking out at the buildings and um, all the construction, and I was struck by this thought. I thought, it's so interesting how everything that I can see with my eyes, all these massive buildings, these roads, these other vehicles, every single one of these things started first as an idea in somebody's mind, a thought. And this struck me because I thought, this is interesting because within just your thoughts, you can actually make a difference to the world. And then I thought, well, if God is real, he is a mind at the foundation of all things from which it follows that everything that I see, plants and trees, planets, come first from thoughts. Thoughts are at the foundation of everything. And so perhaps it's through thinking that we can change the world. But how do you take a thought I mean, that's a very abstract idea, right? So, but how do you practically do this? How do you take a thought and add value to other people? How do you do this practically? Thoughts are like treasures, but how do you deliver these treasures to others? So that's what I want to talk to you. I have a proposal for how APU students who are changing the world and making a difference can change the world through insight. But what happens when insight comes into conflict with what's good, what's hopeful, something that I would like to be true? When I was a senior in high school, I first experienced this conflict between finding out what's true and having a view of the world that I wanted to be true. I had a friend, I'll call him Bob, who was in a biology class. Yeah, you're laughing. His name wasn't really Bob. <laughs> but uh, he, he said that he didn't believe in God. And, you know, we would talk before class and talk about biology and talk about um, the origin of the universe and things like this. And I had, this was the first time I actually ever met somebody personally who did not think that God was real. 
And so he was just very honest about that. And at first, I was kind of disturbed by that. Like, what do you mean you don't believe in God? Like, what about the evidence? So I began to cite my favorite arguments for the existence of God. And one by one, he had responses. He had thought about this before. And he had questions. And so I thought, well, naturally, you know, you don't believe in God. So, you know, there must be something in your life you don't want to believe in God. There must be, maybe you were injured um, emotionally by people who believe in God. And so you're trying to flee the existence of God, and that's why you don't believe in God. And so I began to get deeper into this relationship and have these conversations, and I remember one time he told me he just had no evidence, like that's why he didn't believe in God, and he just really wasn't sure. And then he said this, and this struck me, he said, I want to believe in God. In fact, I think it would be so great if I could believe that the world is governed by a being that loves all creatures, and that has power over all things. That would be awesome. But I just don't see how to do that. I don't have the evidence. This startled me. I mean, I mean, th this was confusing to me. And so how did I respond to that? Well, I told him, I know for sure that you're wrong. I, I, I have no doubt that God is real. That's, that's how I responded in that conversation. But he sowed the seeds of question and doubt, and I began to investigate I began to study science and study philosophy. And I began to not really see what evidence I had for believing in God. Because all the evidence I thought I had, I now had responses to that evidence. And then I began to think about evil and suffering and wondering why God might allow that and, and questions about the afterlife and heaven and hell. And, and all of a sudden, one day coming home from school, I began to sink into a feeling of doubt and agnosticism. Belief in God left me. And I remember what it felt like in that moment of not believing in God. And I remember then getting home and lying in my bed and thinking, pondering my non-existence that would follow my death and what that would be like to be absent from reality forever. It scared me. So I wanted to believe in God but I didn't know how. I couldn't. I couldn't see a way to. And why couldn't I believe in God? Well, in that moment, I said to myself, this is all that I could think, was I don't have any evidence, any reason to believe. And even though I wasn't sure that God didn't exist, I had enough uh, sort of a thought that maybe I'm wrong, hopefully I'm wrong, that I remember praying and saying, God, if you're real, if you're really there, please just show me some evidence. You know, move my ceiling fan. Demonstrate if your reality. <laughs> my ceiling fan did not move. And my heart sank even more. In fact, I remember one time even asking God to be real. I was like, dear God, please be real. As if he could answer a prayer like that. Right? If he's not real, he can't become real. And so in this moment, I discovered what it was like to not believe in God and what it was like to be on the outside looking in at people who go to church and who believe in God. And I wanted to believe in God, but I just didn't know how to do it. And I discovered that I had a story about atheists and about agnostics, a narrative about them, that was actually problematic. So now my friend at school, Bob, we continued our conversations, but now I was like him. And I wasn't sure what to think or what to believe. And so I just want to share with you just a few different problems that I discovered about my narrative. Uh, first, I discovered that my, my narrative of atheists and agnostics, it was just, it was just too simple. It was too simple. Uh, you know, I just simplified. I had my own story of why they didn't believe, and maybe that story does apply to some, but it doesn't therefore apply to everybody, and it didn't apply to me. <laughs> the story that I had about agnostics, you know, that they don't want to believe in God, they're trying to hide their sin, they're hurt from the church, not my case. I wanted to believe in God. I loved church. I loved worship, you know, worshiping this morning with you guys was great, you know, it's great. If only there is a being that loves me, you know, I just didn't have the evidence. So my view was just too simple. Second, my view was too negative. It was just too negative. Um, I didn't see the virtues in the people who disagreed with me. So here's what I discovered. I discovered what it was like to have courage to face reality even if the reality is not what I want to be true. Courage, that's a virtue. 
All right? Now, I think it's also courageous to seek for a treasure even before you know if the treasure is there to be found. So I think you can have a courageous truth seeking for treasures and not give up that seeking. I realize in a group this big, I know from talking with APU students, not everybody comes from a Christian background, and many of you struggle, and some of you have a legitimate doubts, and it takes courage. And I, I feel like I just want to affirm that, because that is a virtue. It takes courage to seek after truth, to follow evidence wherever it leads. The third thing that was problematic that I found with my own narrative of atheists was that it lacked compassion. I remember, so this was in high school, right, senior year of high school. I remember in college, I went to Arizona State, and there was a girl in my college, in one of my classes, who was also in my high school, so she knew me in both places. And by the time I got to college, I understood what it was like to have different perspectives on religion. And I remember she told me during a conversation after class that something had changed about me, and she didn't know what it was. What changed? And it was a positive thing. She was feeling known by me. She was feeling like I saw her as a real person. Whereas in high school, before I went through my time of doubt, I saw people as, I don't know, this maybe sound a little crude, but almost like tools for my own ministry. Like, you're my opportunity to evangelize you. But I didn't have compassion. I didn't treat them as a real person. And so what I want to share with you, and I'm going to do this somewhat briefly, but I want to share with you some of the clues that I began to discover that led me to back into believing in God, all right? So uh, my purpose as a philosopher, those who've taken my classes know my purpose, is to have insight about things that matter, to have truth that is a treasure for other people. And so I want to share some of the treasures that I discovered as I began to study. I, I remember going to the library and picking out books by atheists, books by believers in God, and studying the arguments. I, I remember just really wanting to face reality as it is, so I remember at, at just deciding, I'm going to follow the evidence wherever it leads. I just don't care. I would rather know the truth and be an atheist than pretend that God is real and loves me and not know the truth. So I made that decision to follow the truth wherever it leads. And my journey led me back to believing in God. So I'm just going to share three, tra three clues, and these clues sort of lead to other clues. This is going to be a little bit advanced, but these are the reasons that appeal to me. And each one of these can be unpacked in much more detail. Um, so the first clue it just has to do with existence, okay? So I don't know about you guys, but I've wondered why there's anything at all. I know it's such a philosopher's question, but why is there, you know, imagine that instead of things, there's just empty space. Nothing. Just, it would be so much more elegant, beautiful, eh, maybe not beautiful, but simple that way if there was just nothing. Uh, or even just no space at all. But why is there something rather than nothing? Well, during my journey, I began to understand that the concept of God that's universal, that transcends culture and transcends time, it, the God of the philosophers is all, also the God of the Judeo-Christian tradition, is the God that's supreme the God that is as great as a being can be thought to be. That's the basic concept. And anything less than that is a lesser God. It's not the, sort of the, the real God if there is a real God. The best possible being you can imagine. So, when you think about that, what kind of a being would be the best kind of a being? Would it be the kind of being that could stop existing, that could be smashed and torn apart? Or is it the kind of being that exists in a kind of robust way, where its existence is, in fact, necessary. It can't fail to exist. Philosophers call this a necessary being. So here's a prediction. You know, think about scientists. They have theories, they have predictions, and then you test the predictions by observation. One prediction that you get from the God hypothesis is that there is something rather than nothing, and that there couldn't have been nothing. So you, if theism is true, then it follows that there is a something that can't fail to be. And in fact, that explains why there is something rather than nothing. Now, that's a complex argument, it's a deep argument, but let me just say that in my studies of this argument and my publications, I have not found a better explanation for why there is something rather than nothing than, that, than, than the God explanation, that there is a being that is supreme. That provides the simplest and best explanation of why there's something rather than nothing. 
Okay, that's sort of a philosopher's argument. Then there's a scientific argument, and I remember coming across evidence from science suggesting that the something isn't just there, but it's finely tuned, specifically targeted to allow for biological complexity for life to exist. Now, I can't go into all the details, but I'll just say that one philosopher and physicist, Robin Collins, studies the fine-tuning argument, and he compares the degree of fine-tuning for life to throwing uh, an arrow across the galaxy and hitting a small target. And he says that hitting that target is like getting a universe suited for life. If you miss the target, you don't get a universe suited for life. Lots of things have to be just right at the level of the entire universe. I did a computer program where I simulated biological evolution. Some of you who have taken my classes know about this. And I discovered very quickly that in order to create a program in which there can be life forms, things have to be set up just right. I can't just randomly run my program. It's extremely, extremely fine-tuned, and a random program doesn't even give the building blocks for any kind of evolution to even get started. So this weighed on me. And I began to study, you know, what do the atheists say about that? And I began to go really deep. And in my studies, I found that it seems that the best explanation for why the universe is finally tuned for life is that um, there is a mind behind it. This is what you would predict if there's a supreme being. A supreme being would have all the positive attributes to the highest degree. So that means it would have knowledge, power, goodness, perfection, moral perfection, right? to the highest degree. That's what's predicted by the supreme being hypothesis. It makes sense, all right? Third clue, difference between right and wrong. And you're familiar with this, that there's a moral order. Um, and I understand that people can investigate the nature of morality, the difference between right and wrong. But what occurred to me wasn't just that people uh, say that there are objective moral standards, but even just that people who think that moral, morality isn't objective, the fact that they have moral opinions in the first place, the fact that they think that truth-seeking is a good thing, right? That we should follow the evidence wherever it leads. You know, that bigotry is bad. You know, that we should not be racist, right? They, these thoughts that they come up in us make sense if at the foundation of all things is a moral being that creates a moral order. And as a summary point, I found that the more I investigated the world, the more I found clue after clue after clue leading to a grand vision of reality. It's on the basis of things that I would see that I would infer that there's a being who I don't see behind the scenes. Whereas, and if there were more time, we could go into it, the best of the arguments against God are all arguments based on what I don't see. I don't see God's reason for allowing this event to happen. But God, having a God-sized intellect would have reasons, perhaps some of which I don't know. So I'm not so surprised by that. So that's sort of my summary statement of clues. Now, of course, there's more investigation to be done, but I will say this. The more that I've studied the universe, the more that I've investigated, the more confident I've become that there is a God behind the scenes. This story of clues leading me back to God is reminiscent of how I met my wife, Rachel. So it was like at first sight, and pretty soon we began hanging out and, you know, you know, what's a guy to do but think about how I can get this girl to marry me. So, you know, we hadn't even started dating. Maybe I was a little over the top, <laughs> um, but I was interested, right? So I came up with this scheme called the scavenger hunt and I created clues. And each clue led to another clue, led to another clue, led to another clue. And the final clue was a marriage proposal. And I began to set this up within the first week of our hanging out together. <laughs> <laughs> so it took about a month before she found the first clue, about a month, all right? And she found that first clue. Uh, and by that point, we were dating, all right? So that's good, that's progress. And then that clue <laughs> led her to another clue, to another clue. But what was interesting to me is that as our relationship grew more, her interest in the clues increased and she began to find the clues at a faster and faster rate. Until at the end, she had ended up going on a mission and she had five clues all in one day and we're getting toward the end of the whole thing. And by this point now, we were, you know, more seriously dating. Our, t our time together was pretty, um, I should say, I don't know, there's something about 
having lots of time together sort of accelerates a relationship. So, you know, it was about six months or so, and she starts getting to the end of the clues. And so I went ahead and, and created the final date where I was going to propose to her. And so she got to the final clue, and she was all excited about the clue. And then I took her on a date. And then um, on that date, I had a poem ready for her that I, I was going to propose to her as soon as I was done reading the poem. So I was reading the poem, and my heart was really beating, and I wished that I had written a longer poem because <laughs> I was about to propose. So I got to the end of the poem, and I just got on my knee, and I was just got to go for this. And I asked her if she would marry me, and she burst out into tears. I was like, does that mean no? <laughs> and no, she said yes. And two months later, we got married. We've been married for 10 years. <laughs> so it was, it was good news. Now, all right. So yes, it, it, it is, it's a joyful occasion. I mean, it, it's been a great joy. Now, here's the thing. Seeking after truths, seeking after clues can lead to a treasure. And so out of my journey to gain insight about God, I have what I think are real treasures. You know, I have friends, atheist friends, who I really admire. And, and if they want this treasure of a belief in God, we can have a conversation about it. I'm working on a book called How Reason Led Me to Believe in God, where I lay out a bridge of reason to help people to have some of the treasures. And so sometimes it's, it can seem like truth comes into conflict with treasure, but like I said, there's courage in pursuing a treasure, even before you know it's there. And treasures can then lead to a gift that you can have for other people. So again, one thing that I love about APU students, like I said, is that they really want to make a difference. You guys really want to change the world. It's really cool. And you guys have insights about so many things, things that I don't know. You have your own journey. You know, at APU, you're learning not just how to sort of puff up your head with knowledge, but you're learning values. You're learning principles for life. And so I just want to share with you a few principles, a few tips that I find to be extraordinarily helpful for how to take the insights that I've gained and then actually making a difference in the world so that it isn't just stuck in my head, but it's actually resulting in physical differences so that when I'm driving to you know, LA, I can actually see differences in the world on the basis of insights that I have. So how your insights can change the world. A few little tips. And these are just from my own experience as a philosopher, as a thinker, as a truth seeker. This is perhaps the most important one. Value those who disagree with you in such a way that they actually feel valued by you. you know, I mean, what if the people on, on your Facebook, right, what if the people who disagree with your political views feel about you that you think they're great? You know, what would that be like? You know, what if when I was um, in my time of, of, of doubt, if I began to value the people who also don't believe in God. I mean, that's actually what happened. And that's why that friend at, in college saw something different about me. It's because I saw her as a person rather than as an opportunity for witnessing or whatever it is. I saw her fundamentally, most importantly, as someone valuable. And we could have a whole day on just how to value people, something I'm constantly learning and trying to improve upon. Seeking their perspective is one great technique so it's very easy to oversimplify the perspectives of the people who disagree with you, right? I mean, you know this. Um, and I found that by just entering in to the other person's perspective, I can discover gold. And so now that I know what it's like to be an agnostic, to not believe in God, I understand that when I'm in conversation with somebody who doesn't believe in God, they might actually have this great virtue called truth-seeking, called courage. You know, I mean, I can look into their perspective and look for gold. It's actually a lot harder, but a lot more fun to find gold in other people rather than to simplify them and find the worst thing about them and let that be the thing that you focus on. So I find that if I can just seek their perspective, I can be much more effective at actually bringing my insight to that person, or maybe I'll discover that they had an insight for me, and then I gain a treasure that I would have missed out on if I thought that, you know, I have all the insights. A third point is to aim to edify. I mean, this is perhaps obvious by now, but as philosophers, I mean, we're kind of an interesting group. I mean, we 
write books and articles on the nature of meaning. And not just the meaning in sort of this grand sense of like, what's my purpose in life, but on the meaning of proper names versus improper names. And we think that's very interesting. And there's value there. But sometimes it's easy for us to lose sight on the bigger picture. What's the purpose? Truth matters, but people matter more than truth. So can we use our truth to edify, to build people up? And do this by practicing, pursuing depth of insight. So remember, I had some arguments for the existence of God until I encountered real-life people who had questions about those arguments, legitimate, honest questions. And so my view was over simple. So I needed to have a deeper insight in order to understand better the nature of reality. So this is an ongoing project. This is one of my main purposes, is to pursue insight about things that matter. Obviously, you want to offer them with gentleness and res respect. You know, that's an effective way to do that. And then you, it's important to see the person, I mentioned this, is truth matters that the person matters the most, right? It's the person that, that's the most important reality. And then finally, and I forget this oftentimes, but to ask God for help. <laughs> so now I'm in a place where well, I do believe in God, right? I have reasons to believe in God. And I find very practically, when I say, God, help me, I don't even know how to deal with this situation. I'm not sure how to go about this. Uh, that's a way in which I gain wisdom. It's a way in which I become humble. It's a way in which I reorient myself to really adding purpose, to really adding great value. So I have a vision that I want to read to you. And it's about the impact of, that we can have on the world. A few years ago, I went to Cambodia, and I noticed that, uh, you know, great country. I noticed my friends would throw trash on the floor. They would just drop it on the floor or on the ground, wherever they went. And I thought that was kind of strange. I said, well, let's just clean this up. And they said, well, no, that's not something that we do. This is just normal. We put trash on the ground. And as I flew back from that event, I just pondered that. And I just thought, you know, I take it for granted that, you know, in the United States, we have trash in trash bins. Why? Because that's what we know. They don't have a model for that. What if there are things that we could do, ways that we could clean up the world, that we just don't have a model for? We don't have a model for what to do with our emotional garbage, so we spew it around without much thought. So I have a vision of a new way of thinking. I call this a vision of the new insight bringers. This is what they do. They package their ideas with kindness. So whenever I log on to Facebook, the insight bringers, they're recognizable. Their posts carry treasures for others, and they are delivered in the tone of love. When they share insight, whether it's about politics, about religion, money, relationships, and so on, there is a certain character to their message. There's a certain character quality to their posts. It goes kind of like this. Those who don't agree with their message feel loved by it. They feel valued. They feel approved. They feel understood. They feel appreciated. When I watch YouTube videos by atheists calling religious people naive, I can expect comments below from the religious insight bringers. Their comments display great respect, kindness, and curiosity. So instead of finding things like, I feel sorry for you, or repent or die, <laughs> I find comments like, that's a fascinating argument. I'm curious what you may say about this. Or simply, I love your presentation, if they mean that. The insight bringers are self-secure enough that they don't need to put others down in order to feel valuable. They don't need to always feel heard or understood. They see their insights as potential gifts to actually empower others. The insight bringers treat their insights as treasures while they treat the people as the greatest treasures on earth. And this is, I believe, how your insights are and will, in fact, change the world. Thank you guys for your time. Go in peace.